first, seated in the middle here, is uh, Ted Celeste. Ted uh, served in the Ohio legislature from 2007 to 2012 uh, and gained a well-deserved <coughs> reputation for working effectively across the aisle, uh, whether he was serving in the majority or in the minority. Uh, we recognized him at the Glenn School uh, for his emphasis on civil dialogue with our Outstanding Public Service Award in, in 2011. He is now the founder and director of Next Generation, a project of the National Institute of Civil Discourse, in partnership with the Council of State Governments. The goal is to inspire and support state legislators who want to promote greater understanding and better decision making. Just to his right, your left, is Senator Frank LaRose, who is currently serving his first time term in the Ohio Senate, uh, representing the 27th District uh, of Ohio. Uh, he is a decorated Army veteran, uh, and he serves on a variety of committees in the Senate, but in the spirit of today's discussion, I'll highlight his service uh, as a member of the Joint Committee on Agency Rule Review, which is comprised of uh, members of both the Senate and the House, another bridge-building activity. Uh, Senator LaRose uh, has worked with, Sen uh, with Representative Celeste, former representative, uh, on his initiative to promote civility in public discourse. Uh, they've done this before, uh, and so what I'm going to do is actually turn over the stage to them uh, and make sure that they behave civilly, uh, but I have no doubts that that will, that will be the case. They'll give you a little bit of background on why this is an important issue, why they feel passionately and strongly about it, uh, and then we'll conduct a little bit of a discussion about it. Please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Trevor, and uh, it's so good to see uh, Senator Glenn and Annie here, and thank you so much for all you do uh, for this uh, this effort and uh, and believing strongly in the idea of civility and your uh, standard that you set for others. Appreciate that. Um, I, I noticed in your introduction you said uh, that Frank was to my right but to their left. That should a accurately put things out there. That it's, it's a matter of perspective how you view it. So I think that worked well. Um, I'm going to give you a real quick snapshot about what got me involved in this because I'm really passionate about it, I'm excited about it. Um, I come from a political family, but uh, it wasn't until um, 2005 when it really sparked uh, a desire to try to do something about it for me. 2005, at our church, First Community Church in Grandview, we had a, a program that was developed, and uh, Bobby was here, my wife and I, were part of the beta group that developed the program. Together with uh, other uh, political folks, our church has a nice mix of Democrats and Republicans. Uh, at the time then, Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Tom Moyer was in the group uh, with me that helped develop the, the program. And it was called Faith in American Politics, and it was a program of, uh, that, that was designed to build community and understanding and, and, and an effort to really develop civil discourse. And it was uh, during Lent of 2005, an uh, eight-week uh, course, three hours a night, one night a week for eight weeks, intense discussions, very passionate discussions about issues of importance to everyone, and it really got me excited. We had about 350 people participate, the frustrating thing was most of the people who were there well, believed the same thing, that it was important to do this and, and we belong to the same congregation at the church and what do we do with this? It was about that time somebody approached me and said, have you ever thought about you know, running for state representative? We have a district here that we think you could, you could uh, win. Described it for me, there was a Republican incumbent. Um, I, looked at it and I said, well, only if I could do it differently. Take what we learned in this uh, workshop and use it to try to uh, make a difference about how we run and how we govern. So I said, I'm going to do an all-positive campaign. Managed to do that, managed to win, uh, beat the Republican incumbent, managed to get into office, and um, at that time, we had uh, a split government, and then we, we had a Democratic governor, and we had a Republican House, a Republican Senate. 
but it taught me the value of being able to now talk to people who I had to not the knot over the head and call them all kinds of names and everything, and it began a process for me. However, the things changed. We, the, the makeup of the House and the Senate changed. The, well, the Senate stayed the same. The makeup of the House and the Governor's office changed. And I saw a dynamic developing that was very difficult. I still tried to make a difference by working across the aisle. We were, I think, uh, somewhat successful at that. It was in 2012, my last year, when the Council of State Government said, we understand that you're interested in this whole uh, civil discourse process. We'd like you to consider doing a workshop for us at the Midwest Regional Co Annual Conference in Cleveland. Um, we have a Republican colleague of yours from the state of Iowa who is interested in the same thing. We think you guys would get along. He introduced us, we got together, uh, put together a, a workshop that we had no idea how many people would come. We ended up having 75 people among them, Senator LaRose and a number of other uh, legislators from Ohio. The senator suggested that we get Ohio legislators together and do this workshop just for Ohio. And there it was. This is how it uh, started. And now it's grown, and I'll, I'll let the, the senator talk some about his involvement, but I, I want to tell you more about what's happened because it's growing and it's got a national presence and it's really pretty exciting. Thanks, Ted. And uh, thanks, Senator, and, and to all of you, thanks so much for being here. Uh, I, I, as this conversation goes on, we're going to talk about some of the causes and, and some of the things that we're doing to address this. So I wanted to start off by talking about my interest in this and, and as Ted suggested uh, he, he had this conference in Cleveland uh, that, that he uh, led and uh, there's a reason why a lot of us came to that room when we had a, a whole menu of, of different breakout sessions to choose from and that's because I think that people recognize that this matters and so uh, my interest in this topic started when I first came to the state legislature four years ago and it started from the acknowledgement that the work that we do in the public arena really matters and that we can't do our best work unless we work together and that there is something standing in the way of us working together and and i was working to try to struggle and, and find out what that was and, and what i identified is this lack of civility that exists not only in the way that we run campaigns uh, but in the way that we conduct ourselves sometimes within the state legislature uh, and, and for that matter at the federal level uh, it it uh, occurred to me early on how much effort is put into uh, this this uh, notion that uh, there's one side and the other, and one side needs to constantly be focused on making the other side look foolish. And that's not the way that good public policy is done. Uh, you can't come into every conversation worried about uh, who's wearing what hat, uh, because then we don't do our best work. Each of us in the state senate represent 350,000 uh, Ohioans, and in the House of about 110, I believe. And each of those people that we represent deserves to have their voice heard in the state legislature. It's a remarkable thing in, in, in all of human history that, that we've sort of found this way of solving problems by picking representatives that go and meet. We've got a little room down the, down the road here in a stone building where, where 33 Ohioans get together on one side and 99 Ohioans get together on the other side and we solve problems. Uh, and we're there to represent the diverse communities that we serve. All of that breaks down uh, when we're not able to work together to find commonality and solve problems. And so that's why I got interested in this. Uh, that's why I wanted to work to, uh, to try to find ways to make it better. I was hesitant at first because I, I, I think that this is in some ways an unsolvable problem. Uh, meaning that uh, you know if you endeavor to fix civility, you're inevitably going to be a little disappointed, I think. It's kind of like world hunger or peace, big esoteric ideas really worthy of our attention, but something that's never fixed entirely. Uh, and then the other thing is that I think that the, the concern was you put yourself out there as someone who's trying to work to improve civility, inevitably all of us will fall short of, of those kind of high ideals, and so then will you be labeled a hypocrite for having done so. Uh, I decided to push those two concerns aside and work on this because this is something worth working on. And there are things that we can do to make it better. And in so doing, we will ultimately do a better job of serving the people that we serve. And it comes full circle because this is about this work that we do as public servants and how much it matters. So thank you so much. Look forward to our conversation.
Thanks, thanks both for the introduction. Um, and I know we, I'm, I'm eager to hear how we fix it, uh, but I think it's helpful to start with why it exists. So I want to start by hearing from you about what your estimation is, is the, what are the causes of, of this? Why, why do we have this level of instability in political discourse in this country? First of all, I think that they are, they are many. Um, and, and also, I think it's key to point out at this point that this is nothing new. I think every generation is inclined to think it's terrible, it's worse than it's ever been, woe is me, that kind of thing. But we need to remember that back through history, uh, when, when we talk about our public business, emotions run high. Uh, these are things that impact our lives, these are things that impact uh, the futures of our community, so, so it's, it's, it's okay for emotions to, to become involved, but what's not okay is for those emotions to become manifest as personal uh, hatred or, or dislike of, of the other person involved in the conversation. Remember that we've had a vice president and a uh, secretary of the treasury in a pistol duel. We've had members of the legislature beating one another with canes on the floor. Uh, so things have been bad before. But in my estimation, one of the causal factors here is the way that legislative districts are drawn or redistricting. Uh, it's, it's one issue. I think that in some ways we've gotten so sophisticated at this, uh, at this process that we've created districts where the only contest is the contest that's held in the spring. And, uh, and many of my colleagues, though they're good people, don't face a general election opponent of any real significance. And uh, so when you're representing a district where your only electoral contest is a primary, uh, it doesn't take a, a political science professor to tell you that those individuals are going to tend to move more towards the margins. Uh, they're going to tend to, to gravitate towards the far right and the far left. So that's, that's part of it. There's no incentive for compromise, especially in an environment where compromise is viewed as weakness, and, and that's the kind of thing that gets you defeated in a primary. I think the campaign finance is an issue that we need to address as well. Um, and, and, uh, and another one is the way that we uh, communicate. All of the new ways that we have, anyone with a uh, smartphone or a laptop is a publisher and uh, can do so in such a way uh, that is not fact-checked or peer-reviewed or you, you just put it out there. And many times you can do so anonymously. Uh, when, you can, when you can say any type of thing you want to about someone and do so anonymously, it doesn't bring out the best in our nature. I'd add that uh, winning and control has so much uh, emphasis within each of the caucuses, either in the House or the Senate, so that once you're in office, the nature of what you discuss and what you uh, offer as legislation is done as much from the leadership of the caucuses view, uh, is this going to help us get uh, elected or help us win control, or will it uh, be problematic? And uh, I'd like to cite it in my own instance that there was an example where I thought it had reached the ultimate limit, and uh, the, right after, right before the 2010 election, um, I had been working for a year on a bill uh, on, uh, on dyslexia, and I had found an interested party on the other side of the aisle who happened to be, at that time, the minority leader, who is now the Speaker of the House, but he was the minority leader then. And he uh, wished to co-sponsor it with me. We were going to co-sponsor the bill. This was the summer of 2010. Um, my caucus leaders said to me, you can't do that. And I said, well, why is that? And they said, well, it'll make the Republicans look like they care. <laughs> Come on. I mean, really. This is really what was said. And uh, frankly, uh, we went ahead uh, to, we, we introduced the bill, but we, you know, it didn't, get a chance to move it along, but what happened then was, okay, 2010, we got creamed in the election. Now, uh, Minority Leader Batchelder, the Speaker Batchelder, and he said, I want this bill to pass. I'll get you a colleague of mine. We'll reintroduce it. You'll get it done. That's what it's all about. That's the way it should be done. And so I'd, I'd suggest that this cockamamie view that it's all about winning and control has got us way off base. Okay, so so earlier uh, you said I uh, very well that, that in this current environment compromise is viewed as a weakness. What, why is that? Why is compromise second or third or last relative to? 
Well, I, I guess I don't know uh, what has caused that notion, but it is pervasive. Uh, I believe that compromise is the way that statesmen and women solve problems in a democracy. It's imperfect. Uh, it doesn't. It, does, it, it means that you can't expect 100% of your ideology to win the day. Uh, but uh, in, in, a, in a system such as ours, that's the way you have to expect our statesmen and women to, to interact with one another. Um, I think that uh, there, there's this. Uh, there is a, a, a sort of a partisan uh, sense in, in, in media, in some ways, where uh, if you uh, if you give in, if you compromise, if you get half a loaf. Uh, then you're giving in to the other side, and then you will be uh, excoriated on the blogs or on talk radio or what have you for that. I think that's part of it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, it just popped into my mind the, the, the discussion that's uh, going on among the Cardinals right now. I mean, if you think about it, here is some very strongly held positions uh, that are not that have not been talked about for a long, long time. Out comes one suggestion that, that, that there may be some modification of beliefs, and the other side starts thinking about, wait a minute, maybe that's a little too far. So they start to work at, at, at a different definition. Of what and it, to me, it's you don't, you, you're not necessarily giving up on, uh, on principle to have a really meaningful discussion and truly listen to the other side. That's one of the pieces that's often been missing, is the, the quality of listening. Because what happens in some of these discussions is you are already thinking about your response from, and from your perspective before you've even given a chance to, to hear the, the alternative. So the issue of coming together is has a bit Part of this is also the way that we've clustered. And, and there's a book called The Big Sword by a man named I think Ben, uh, many of you probably have, have, are familiar with it. And it talks about how we've not only physically arranged ourselves by ideology, but we've, we've also arranged our, 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 our media consumption habits by ideology. And, and, and that um, I almost think of it as, as becoming sort of tribal. Uh, there's the, the elephant tribe and the donkey tribe, and we've, we've picked which one we want to be a part of, and we don't want to interact with the other tribe because our views may change. And, something like that. And, and, and that brings itself down to the state legislature and, and at the federal level. And term limits only exacerbate that because we don't get to know one another as well as we should. There's this uh, transactional nature to what we do right now where uh, there aren't long-term relationships and those relationships that can lead to trust and that trust that can lead to the ability to work together and compromise. This, this, this is a good segue to the, the nature of what it is that we've done within our within our work, we call our workshop "Building Trust Through Civil Discourse." It's a, it's a half day workshop, and one of the most powerful pieces of it is something we call political journey. And it's something that came as a result of, of uh, that uh, faith in American politics experience. And and I think that the, the the piece that's so important in having that kind of communication is understanding the other person. So this exercise really is meant to, and what we do is ask the legislators to think about what it is that was an event in their life that was a very powerful determining event in who they are politically today. And for all of you to think about that as, a, as, as something that, who, what is it that it impacted who you are today? I'm, I'm going to take a minute, if it's okay, and share with you how I kick it off. and um, and and get people to a level of thinking and understanding someone else's point of view. Okay, I came from a political family. I, uh, I grew up in a Democratic household. Uh, I was lucky enough, my mayor, uh, my dad was elected mayor when I was in the fourth grade. Uh, this was the 60s. Uh, he brought uh, Jack Kennedy to my town, hometown. I got inspired by Jack Kennedy. I was so thrilled by the fact that he was uh, in my hometown. Uh, I decided I was going to dedicate my life to his message, and my wife and I ended up going off to the Peace Corps as a result. But uh, one of the things that happened, I, I, I go to uh, college at the College of Worcester, freshman year, November 1963. I'm going to class, going to an intro class, um, and 
the radio says the president's been shot. I have one put on the radio. The teacher is the professor is a professor of music who's leading this discussion. And he says, we don't allow uh, radios in here. And I said, but the president's been shot. And he said, Kennedy's come and go with Bach lives on forever. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, here I am, you know, still a teenager, and I'm, you know, there's my idol, and I'm, oh man, and I'm crying, I walk in, I, and I put the radio on anyway. And so I'm listening to the, listening to the radio, and uh, not much more longer. I just sit, I sit down, and now I'm bursting in tears because they said he's, yeah, he died. The professor looks at me, he realizes what happened. He closes his book walks out of the classroom, goes to the chapel, and composes a requiem. Incredible. I didn't realize it until 25 years later, but one of the people sitting next to me had that same event uh, experience, and he became a poet, teaches poetry at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, uh, his name's Ron Wallace. Here's his poem about that same event. Conspiracy theory. The day that JFK was shot in Dallas, I was in Ohio, a Republican, almost 18, my father's voice still on my tongue. He hated JFK, and though I didn't know why, I thought I must hate him too. So when Ted Celeste burst in the classroom, his voice a sorrow brimming with the news, I leaned back in my seat and said one word. Good, I said. And all eyes turned on me, and that class was dismissed. And that one word armed and dangerous, went out into the world, as if I blessed the future with my scorn, which echoed back across the century like a lone assassin. Good, good, good. And as part of the discussion, to be able to talk about personal experiences that really impact you personally, where, you know, who, who it is in your heart, and where your political beliefs came from, and then understand when someone raises their objections to your particular point of view, if they've had an understanding of where you're coming from, that discussion is very, very different. And indeed, and I'll finish with this, sorry it taken so long. Um, at the session we were at in Cleveland, two sitting legislators realized that the same event in their lives led to one of them changing from a Republican to a Democrat and the other changing a Democrat changed their relationship as a result. I mean, it was an incredible, if you remember that, uh, that experience. So I, I would suggest that the personal storytelling part is incredibly important for people to understand each other. Senator Rose, how do, you, how do you get into a space, given what you were describing earlier, mm -hmm. and you are now in the House and the Senate, where you can have those kinds of personal conversations, those kinds of discussions with your colleagues across the aisle? Well, it may sound trivial, and, and uh, but it, it comes down to finding time to, uh, to to get to know one another and finding time to recreate together. Uh, we organized a, a thing a year ago in the Senate where uh, we all went bowling. And uh, there were no journalists, there were no lobbyists. We were there in jeans and t-shirts, and there were pitchers full of mediocre beer on the table. And we were bowling, and uh, you know, I remember uh, one of my colleagues who who is thought of as pretty far left uh, politically, and one of my colleagues who's thought of as pretty far right politically, were teaching each other how to bowl, and they're both terrible bowlers. <laughs> but the the Republican stepped up to bowl, and she'd been throwing it in the gutter all night, and the Democrat said, "You've got to move further to the left." <laughs> So, yeah, and of course everybody cracked up, but those kind of things are where we can get to know one another and, and recognize that we're not just uh, sort of Republican and, and Democrat, but we're mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and, and, and people that, that love this state and want it to be better. And we may have differing opinions on how it can get there, uh, but I think that it, it, will, it can help us question each other's motives less. Uh, I think that it's, it's very reasonable and, and expected for us to question each other's policies, question your, your your stances on issues, but let's try not to question each other's motives. And, and, and so that's that's one part of it. And, and then just by uh, by getting to know one another and building those those collegial friendships, uh, it gives you the space where you can say, 
hey Ted, how are you thinking about voting on this today? Well, you know, there's this one thing that may keep me from, from being able to support it. And then you say, well, let's work on an amendment together. I think we've got time to do that. Let's sit down and do it. And those are the kind of things where you can solve problems together. But it just takes having uh, sort of breaking out of that tribal mentality and, and just getting to know each other. Ted, how do you, how do you build off of that personal connection? How do you, how do you move from there to, to bridging and, and writing a piece of legislation together? Well, it, it, it happened for me a couple times uh, when I think it was by this time in my third term uh, working on legislation when kind of I, I, I backed away from the, res the knee-jerk response I would have had where this person represents the party's point of view on the other side and um, looked at it. There's some good advice that's available here and maybe if I spend a little time getting to know better where they're coming from. And in one instance, uh, was actually a, a bill on street racing, and um, I, I found out that the uh, other individual happened to have a souped-up car, and so I had a perspective on it that uh, I never would have known about. And in talking, I said, "Well, perhaps you can help me work through what some of the pieces of the problem here that we're, that we're unable to move it forward." He got it, uh, got it working, so that we were actually able to work it through our legislative process on the House side and actually passed the bill with his help. Um, it, I think it was the instance of really getting to know the, the perspective a little better that helped in that process. So I have a follow-up to that, but we are moving into the one o'clock hour. If you would like to ask a question, just please migrate towards uh, one of the microphones and then after I ask this next question, I'll, I'll turn and, and open it up to the floor. So, so let's say you, you succeed, you, you get to know somebody at a more personal level, and you write a piece of legislation together. Uh, and let's say good fortune smiles and it gets passed. Um, how do you deal with then the aftermath of it? That maybe other members of your party, do they look favorably on that? Or do they say, oh, you compromised and that's, uh, that's a sin? What's the step, step after that then to sustain this over time? How do we, how do we build off of those social <coughs> connections to make this enduring? And my, my view is uh, Frank's an excellent example of civil discourse is smart or good politics. He, he has taken his interest in this and has been recognized around the state for it. Some people uh, you know, it may have caused him to have a primary opponent that he wouldn't otherwise have had, but he has also, yeah, but he's also come out so much better as a result of it, has a much better message, is a much better role model for all of us, and I mean, I think there's an example. Like I said, I appreciate that. It's a, it is a matter of, of getting out and, and telling your constituents, in this case, why you've taken the position you've taken. Uh, those folks that, that, that may tend to be uh, hyper-partisan and low, in, uh, low information voters are probably never going to be with you on, on something where you cross the aisle. Uh, they're going to say, well, he, he sided with the enemy, which is, I'm using air quotes, because there should be no enemies here in, in politics. We, we have ideological opponents and that kind of thing. But, uh, so, you know, it, it's a matter of, of stating your, your case and, and, and articulating clearly why you, you did what you did. But there are consequences. And, and a lot of this comes from the, um, I think, the interest groups that are involved as well, which do tend very much to reward folks that are on one extreme. If you're, if you're, it's very safe relatively politically on the far right and it's very safe politically on the far left and there are plenty of groups who are eager to stick up for you if you stake out either of those far left or far right positions. But when you come to the middle on something, when you look to solve problems, then you find yourself in a position where you're not liberal enough for the liberals and you're not conservative enough for the conservatives and uh, you know, you, you, sort of there in, in, in the center. It's a, there was a cartoon in the, uh, uh, in the Economist magazine that first ran 10 years ago, and they re-ran it recently, and it showed a group of people with protest signs, and then off to the side, uh, someone or two people were talking. They said, what's all the hubbub about? And, and uh, they said, the, uh, the moderates are rallying again, and they had signs that say, 
what do we want? Gradual change. When do we want it? In due course. <laughs> It doesn't make for good bumper statements. It, it doesn't make for good political slogans, but it is statesmanship. It's how we solve problems. Right. I think we have a question from the floor, Patty. I have a question. Uh, thanks for letting us pose questions to you. Um, a couple times this morning, uh, early childhood education has been mentioned, and you just mentioned um, the bill on dyslexia. And I wanted to um, ask a question about speech and hearing services. We have had in recent past in the state of Ohio over 20 agencies that used to serve individuals for speech, language, hearing um, impairments or delays. And now we are down to four. Cleveland, Toledo, Cincinnati, and one of the larger ones here in Columbus, Columbus Speech and Hearing Center. And my question is this, even this past year, they've had to make changes in their business models, particularly here in Columbus that I'm aware of, and maybe the other three, uh, to reduce their services because there are challenges with reimbursements and they serve everyone from infancy on through the last days of our lives. And many times these families have difficulty affording these services. So my question to you is what um, is being done or should be done to make sure those services don't reduce with the last four that we have and uh, this involves different kinds of reimbursement billings that uh, policies that get made. What's your recommendation or do you know of anything that's being done to preserve those services for the future? To the sitting legislator. <laughs> I mean, uh, obviously that's a, it's a, a policy question, but I guess I'll tie it into the conversation that we're having here, and, and that is about the, the empathy part of, of, of civility and how uh, you know, we have to uh, understand the needs of our fellow citizens, even those that, uh, that we maybe can't directly identify with, such as the population that, that you've served, and, and the reliance that they have on the necessary level of funding that the state offers. Uh, I'm, I'm one that, that believes in those uh, type of services and believes that we need to fund them adequately and at the same time we need to find ways to uh, make sure that they're operating as efficiently as they can. So uh, perhaps a, a good conversation for us to have offline after this, but I'd love to, to work with you to, to find ways that we can advocate that point. Their testing and assessments are kind of the gateway into the early education systems a lot of times because they see the children under the age of right at birth at the hospital. And so I didn't know if there was a relationship with the dyslexia billing. Do you know of anything in that bill that's related to the assessments that are done through our hearing centers? Uh, I don't believe there was anything that was in the bill at the time. No. Thank you. But I would say that, uh, and we'll pick up on what uh, the senator said, that it, it, it really makes a difference for you to talk to, uh, directly to legislators when you can to carry that message. And the personal stories, particular individuals that could come and bring that story, it, it does have an impact. Many people think that it doesn't, but um, I think it has, uh, it has a dramatic uh, effect on legislators' ability to understand uh, the, the situation and perhaps you'll find some allies that you didn't know you might have. We have a question over here. So you'll have to forgive me, I forget the source, but I read an article not that long ago that was speaking about how uh, sunshine laws and public meeting laws have affected the ability of legislators to have uh, kind of those cordial relationships that may have been built in the past in the back rooms. Um, and you add on to that that you have 24-hour news outlets who need a story uh, all the time and, and they're constantly kind of making uh, FOIA requests and you know digging deep into every piece of information that they can provide. And I didn't know if you had any insight on whether you thought perhaps we may want to scale back some of those sunshine laws or, or the, the benefits and the drawbacks to that kind of uh, legislation that has come so this, up. This is treacherous, so I'm going to jump in. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ted was talking about the, uh, the, the meeting that's currently going on with the Cardinals, and I was thinking, here's a group of people that are unelected and able to meet in complete secrecy. They're going to solve some problems together. Uh, sunshine laws are important, and we have to have open and transparent government. It's the solution to so many problems that otherwise exist. And so in our official workings, we, we, we need to keep all of that open and transparent and available. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't get to know one another on, on, a, on a personal level and, and build those relationships. I'll give an example. 
uh, and won't use names, sorry. Uh, but there's a, there's an individual who's a senior staff member uh, in the Senate minority, and, uh, and he was thinking about joining the military. And I served in the Army for 10 years, so he asked me, hey, can we get together after work one day to have a, have a beer, and you can tell me what you know about the Army before I decide to sign up. We did so. My phone started ringing within 20 minutes of us leaving that bar. I hear that you're out with the Senate minority staff. What, what's going on? So it was almost, it was seen by people that, that saw the two of us sitting there having a beer together as um, there must be some sort of collusion or, or, or some sort of bad things going on here. No, just two guys sitting talking about joining the Army. And so that's that kind of thing that, that, that you know, we need to be able to get to know one another. It doesn't mean that we close our, 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 our official business meetings, but it means that we should be able to get together after work and, and, and be friendly. I might add that it, it, it provides an opportunity uh, to have an institution like uh, the John Glenn Center to give an avenue to have the kinds of discussions so that it could be um, done in a public environment and bring together people of both parties to have the kind of uh, opportunity to over a meal be talking about things. And I think that, um, yes, it is a problem with, and, and that's, that's created the situation where you don't have um, caucuses of each side together, a meeting, talking about issues, uh, in addition to the fact that the leadership really doesn't like that. Other question? First, uh, thank you both for taking on this issue and focusing on it. Um, the older we get, the harder it is to change behavior. Any thoughts or suggestions for programs, initiatives in grade schools and high schools that might reshape the future? You know, uh, Dan, that's a great uh, question. The, uh, I think uh, it, it's interesting because I've, I've talked to uh, someone who's uh, involved with uh, perhaps financially giving, making an investment in our activity. And uh, he, his, his background is he's a trained psychologist, but he made a bunch of money uh, in a hedge fund. And as a result, he cr created a, a philanthropy, a philanthropy that deals with just what you talked about. Young kids, how do we get them civically engaged, thinking about how to uh, have, have meaningful uh, understandings and pers perspectives at an early age. I really think that it's important to teach critical thinking so that we don't always adopt what we're listening to, but we, uh, we start to challenge. Also things which, give, which build up you know, young people's self-esteem so that they, they feel comfortable in that role of raising questions. Uh, obviously a lot, of, a lot of this has to come from family, but I think the schools can Opportunities to solve problems through deliberation and, and dialogue, I think, is, is a part of it. And, and some of those things come from formal classroom training. Some of, them think, some of those things come through opportunities. Uh, for me, one of the things that I really valued in my upbringing was uh, participation in the Boy Scouts, but it could be 4-H or any other type of a youth activity where you were uh, given a leadership role and, and uh, uh, try to take uh, six of your peers that are about your age and get them to do something they otherwise wouldn't want to do. I mean, you're going to learn how to solve problems, how to work together, how to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And so those kind of things are, are, are I think, key. And, and uh, we've, we've gotten very good at teaching children how to uh, regurgitate information onto a bubble form, but, uh, but teaching them how to think critically about how to not only arrive at the right answer, but how to ask the right question, I think, leads into this as well. One last question. Uh, hi, I'm Robert Simmerl. I'm a second year MPA at the John Glenn School. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to get the talk with us. I've always felt that getting to know your coworkers in a social setting can really build a team environment that actually functions. My question is, do you think there's any formalized social functions that could be adopted, say, once every few months you'll get together and not discuss work, you'll just get together and get to know one another to help build these relationships. Well, we talked about open meeting laws, we might as well talk about another difficult topic and that is ethics laws because in some ways we've got ethics laws that discourage us from getting together and, and, 
having a meal together, that kind of thing. Because uh, candidly, I think that we've got ethics laws that don't necessarily catch people being unethical, but they catch people being poor bookkeepers. If you don't keep every receipt and, and this kind of thing. Uh, the, the people that are truly unethical that have bad intentions are, are going to find ways to hide that and eventually get caught up. Uh, so institutionalizing that uh, can, can be challenging. One of the things that, that I've done is to work with my sort of local delegation. Uh, I'm from the Summit County area, and so we try to get together uh, about quarterly for a bipartisan delegation breakfast, where it's Republicans, Democrats, House, Senate, and we're just there to talk about what's good for this community, not about what's you know one party's thing or the other. And it, it provides a great opportunity to just have some dialogue and, and talk to one another. So those kind of things are, are good. I think it would make a nice uh, master's thesis to uh, <laughs> offer uh, offer the opportunity for uh, legislators of both parties to come to sessions that you would you would set up and organize. And then we'd... Uh, could I make a comment? Yeah, I was going to build uh, my comment comments. about about getting together socially uh, that strikes a chord with me because in the Senate one time uh, Bob Burr was the uh, majority leader in the Senate and. Uh, he felt that we didn't get together enough. And uh, what he instituted was a, not something sponsored by uh, lobbyists or anything like that, but in the big Senate caucus room there that had been used for dinner sometime, he put, he put together a dinner in there that, that you were supposed to come as, uh, what he expected all senators to come, and, and both sides of the aisle supported that, and bring your wives along too, and we had a dinner, but with one caveat, you do not sit at the table with members of your own party. You had to come in, and Andy and I came in, we sat with some of the Republicans, and some I knew by name, but not very well. But you sat there and you had dinner together. And uh, obviously, from what's going on in Washington right now, it didn't solve all of our problems. <laughs> uh, but it was some years ago, and I think at that time, at least, it had a very positive effect. And he made it into sort of a social time, too, in that uh, there was always some sort of entertainment. And uh, Bob started off himself because it, when he was a younger man, at one time he was a national championship fiddler. <laughs> the old hoedown fiddler type thing. And so he played, and everybody got a kick out of it. And the Republicans had a, uh, a, uh, a uh, group of four guys that used to get together as a barbershop quartet. And there was Trent Lott and Craig and Ashcroft and who was the other one I forget. And they weren't all that bad. They were pretty good. <laughs> and so they'd get up and they'd even uh, answer requests. <laughs> and, uh, and so there was that kind of thing. And they had the, uh, you may remember this, uh, sort of a, a comic group, the Capitol Steps. Uh, they had originated with one of the Senate committees. So he prevailed on them to come back and give a couple of performances. So it was a time period, there was a social period around the table you were at uh, with the with members, of, mainly with members of the opposite party and some entertainment along with it. And it didn't solve all of our problems, but I think it was very, very good. and had a good impact. And uh, you, you weren't nearly as hesitant after something like that of calling up the guy that you'd had dinner with and saying, hey, I'd like to wear a seat and talk, and talk about so-and-so, a piece of legislation, and they do the same thing with me. So I think this, this personal relationship thing that you mentioned, Ted, is, is, is I just think that's very, very important, and there are a lot of ways of doing that. If you think, uh, I also was saying this is uh, a little far-reaching, maybe, maybe, but anybody that's been in the military has had extensive survival training and in the survival training we had there and in the space program also, if you happen to find yourself in, the, in one of the, uh, back in the space days, in the Aborigine areas, and there's an Aborigine area in the Southwest Africa, the Kalahari Desert uh, 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 people had Aborigine tribes still there, and the outback in Australia, and the center uh, spine across Papua New Guinea. And they, the first thing they taught you there was uh, that, uh, you know, be calm, of course, and all that sort of thing. But one of the main things was to work yourself to a point where, they, where they're, they're doing exactly what we're doing here today, and that is they offer you food. 
And if they offer you food, take it, even though it may not be something you're used to eating. You'd be surprised how good a roast cricket tastes or <laughs> like that. But don't turn, don't turn it down because that is a way from time immemorial of saying that we want to communicate with you and we want to get, uh, we want to uh, uh, recognize you as a person because everybody has to eat. And so if, if they offer you something to eat, accept it no matter what it is because that's your first step toward getting a good relationship with those people in, in survival. And I don't think that's too far fetched. The same thing is in, in that in our political life, and uh, how do you get civility in a, a four or five year old kid? Uh, well, you can you can penalize them somewhat, I guess, and, and if they're too rude to their elders or something, maybe a, a fast swallow on the back end does some good sometimes, but uh, and surely we can, we should be able to work these things out. But I just thought the Bob Bird thing, it did have a very positive impact. It didn't solve all of our problems. But uh, you get so locked in on our political views that you lose respect for the views of the other person. And the more you know that other person and know their sincerity, and that they really are truly interested in what's best for the country. They may come from a different background, they may come from a different idea than my idea. And I like to say, well, my idea is better, so I'm going to lock in on it. But the more you know that person and know they're serious, the closer you come to working with them. And uh, Ted, I just want to congratulate you. You've made this a real cause. And I think you've started at the right level, too, uh, with the state legislatures. Uh, and I think that's good to concentrate there. Most of our federal officials, or a high percentage of them, come out of the state legislature. And if they're used to working with people there and working across the aisle, uh, why, that's going to that's gonna continue. Uh, once again in the, uh, the national service and we sure need more of this at the national level uh, whether you're talking about Tea Party or whatever there's got to be ways of bridging this and you're taking a good crack at it so thank you for your efforts Mr. Governor. Thank you. And on that note, let's thank our guests.